Thank you. Um, that, was, that was a very kind, albeit lengthy, introduction, so thank you very much. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here, and I want to say a big thanks um, to, to Eamon for inviting me here and for Trakere to, to put on this event, this very sort of topical and timely event, and also for Maynooth University for, for hosting us today. And we had a great discussion last night um, to sort of set up the day, and it was one of those kind of discussions, there were maybe a dozen of us in the room, where Everyone was so excited to contribute. There was all kinds of interruptions and kind of arguments, and it was really kind of, I hope to sort of bring some of that enthusiasm out today in my presentation. Um, so my background's in, in farm management. I trained in farm management. I sometimes wonder whether I took the right career going into the city uh, and to work in finance, um, having studied agriculture for so long. Um, but for what I learned uh, working in the financial community, um, and it's often said, but it is true, is a lot of the seats of power and influence is not in government um, or commerce more generally, but actually in the financial markets. And, and I know, you know the, the lessons that have been learned the last five years uh, and will con continue to learn uh, play out in other areas. And the ones which is playing out now in, in the climate crisis that we face uh, helps us set a path for what we should do, whether it's to divest uh, or to tackle the problems in the financial markets. And I, I um, have a tendency when, well, there we all have a tendency when looking at something like the problem of climate change to be a little bit gloomy. And so my presentation starts off a little bit gloomy. So you have to forgive me. Uh, but there's hope at the end because I think we do have some pathways of where we can go in the transition. I want to say a few things about my little organization. Um, we did coin this phrase unburnable carbon and, and the phrase stranded assets now used um, in association with the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and we're just analysts. And, and um, I um, set up a carbon tracker with a friend of mine who worked uh, with me at Henderson, a guy called Nick Robbins. And we decided that if you want to take on uh, the power of the fossil fuel industry and the power of the financial markets, you better start off employing the best possible people. So we took the attitude that let's recruit investment bankers, a bit unusual for a not-for-profit, philanthropically driven organization, but I decided to recruit the top analysts from Citigroup and Deutsche Bank and HSBC uh, to join my team uh, and to start uh, trying to turn the tide against the expansionist plans of big coal and big oil. Um, and so we have the ex-global head of research at Citigroup, um, the ex-global head of oil and gas at HSBC, um, and uh, unfortunately, um, some of you may notice the gender balance problem on that screen. Uh, I have struggled to recruit uh, uh, women mining analysts. Maybe there are not many women that want to study coal as a profession in the city, but uh, if you can find one for me, I'll be delighted to recruit and, and change that gender balance. Uh, but what we do um, is we analyze uh, the world's fossil fuel industry and try and set it in the context of, co of carb and climate budgets, which I'll come back to uh, in a minute. But I also want to thank here in the audience uh, Ashton Trust, which is representative of one of the numbers of philanthropic groups around the world that back our analysis, that we then gift and take into Wall Street and the City of London and other financial markets around the world uh, to share our insights and knowledge. So let's um, set some context. So, um, well... If we believe what the scientists are telling us uh, about climate is that we're heading to a very uncertain future. Uh, the extreme weather events of just the last few years, whether it's flood damage in Cumbria, the floods in Thailand, extreme weather events uh, in America, droughts in Australia followed by fires, followed by floods. It's what, uh, 20 years ago, I think the scientists uh, are quite right to sort of say, uh, though not many of them do, but they're quite right if they wanted to say, we kind of told you so. This is what we said the models tell, told us would happen. Um, and we've seen population movements um, around the world to get away, whether it's from floods or from droughts, or a combination of, of droughts and wars uh, as well. Um, uh, though it doesn't have to be like that, as we know. Um, uh, within us, we have the potential to do um, great things um, and to study alternatives and to put effort into developing scenarios uh, for a clean future. And this is the choice we're faced with today. The power of the divestment movement is not just about divesting from fossil fuels. It's actually, it's about the reinvest. It's about finding the opportunities. Um, and what we know is that uh, we're in the middle of a great um, transition in the world's energy markets. Um, and I think probably that's what I'm gonna come into uh, in the core part of my um, talk, is what's really going on um, in the energy sector. 
But as a backdrop, uh, we have these negotiations. I was in Paris uh, for the climate change um, conference and um, policymakers and governments have set these wonderful targets of emissions reductions. Um, I don't know what Angela Merkel was saying to Barack Obama. Uh, maybe it's after the fish had just caught her. She'd been out sort of fishing. Uh, but what we do know is that uh, governments uh, before and then through Paris have set these great targets for reducing emissions by 70% um, just 35 years from now. And we're often told, oh, well, you know, there's not much we can do because the problem uh, is with the Chinese. They're, so it's, they're the ones who are creating the problem. They're the ones building all these coal-fired power stations. But actually, um, what we saw in Paris uh, and before Paris was the two world's the largest economies, greatest nations, the Chinese and the Americans, coming together to set this common objective. Um, we have a global problem, and it's, we're seeing leadership now from um, around the world uh, to reduce uh, um, emissions. Um, there's another thing in there. You probably think, why is, why, why is that in there? And it goes back to really what part of the fossil fuel divestment movement is trying to do is uh, a, an analyst at the University of Minnesota doing academic research, a guy called Rick Heady, uh, looked at the SEC filings, the filings companies have to make in America to the regulators uh, to see what the oil companies and the gas companies were doing to develop their resources. And he's attributed 60% of historical emissions over the last 150 years just to 90 companies. Companies in which you may be an investor, your pension fund may be an investor. Um, so, you know, there is, uh, uh, these emissions are, okay, we, we consume energy, but emissions are down to actually the actions of companies and what their boards say. But in this sort of momentum to an agreement, we've got um, world leaders trying hard, we've got faith leaders trying, trying hard, and, and I heard in Paris that uh, the Holy Father was ringing up presidents around the world, uh, advising them, encouraging them to, to come behind a, a Paris agreement, um, which set a very high sort of uh, expectation, uh, but it's clear that with the leadership that we've seen, that um, there is some hope um, for us to tackle the problems that, that are facing us. And we didn't just get this um, goal of reducing emissions to, to stabilize warming to around two degrees above global average mean temperature rise. And I just want to say something about two degrees. Uh, we often forget the historical average mean was 16 degrees. Doesn't sound a lot, and obviously there's some extremes in the Arctic and, and uh, tropical areas to give you that average. And when we say two degrees, people say, well, you know, it's like the difference between uh, a nice day, which is 20 degrees Celsius, and a, and a quite pleasant day, which is 22 degrees Celsius, and two degrees doesn't sound a lot, but actually it's two degrees against 16 degrees. So that is, quite, in percentage terms, that's quite high. And what we do know, if we were to burn the fossil, all the fossil fuels that we know, you can add another eight, nine degrees above that 16 degrees average. So two degrees is quite a significant change. Um, and governments have set this target of of, um, of around one and a half, which is, which is kind of an aspiration. One of the things that um, thrilled me when we produced the first report at Carbon Tracker uh, was the interest shown by the Bank of England. So um, I did go to the Bank of England a few years ago when we produced our first report and to see not the Governor Mark Carney, but some of his, but has any, have any of you been into the Bank of England? You know they have these uh, salmon paint coats and these top hats, they still got them. You go in through the main door, the Bank of England, you're welcomed in by a guy wearing a pink morning coat and a top hat. Good morning, sir. Um, who let you in? Do please come this way. And I had my chance to present the case for the carbon tracker, which got picked up in the carbon bubble. And Mark Carney um, used the phrase on burnable carbon and stranded assets. And he said, look, the biggest issue facing the future is climate change. If we think we had a problem with mortgage-backed securities, wait till you've seen this one come in. Um, it's going to be the mother of all financial crises when the planet is destabilized to an extent that commerce doesn't function, um, banks aren't functioning because commerce isn't functioning, um, and uh, if we see rising sea levels, Wall Street and London uh, with predicted um, two, to, two, two meters, three meters um, rises in sea levels by you know, in coming, coming century, um, you know, Wall Street would have to move in 100 miles. That's certainly going to be disruptive um, to Goldman Sachs. So what is, the, what is the carbon bubble? I want to just go back to some basics. Um, working um, for a large fund management institution at Henderson um, in London, what I was struck by is the more we knew about the science of climate, 
The more investors talked about their responsibility to society, the more those same institutions wanted to write big checks to the coal and oil companies. And I would see these companies come into our office. Um, Henderson's a big asset manager. The companies like Glencore and Extrata uh, and others similar to them would walk away with very large checks to grow their businesses, which is to expand the fossil fuels. And I thought, well, how this can't possibly be right. Let's try and un unravel this a little bit. And so um, just to say something about carbon budgets, well, when we burn a fossil fuel, you know, the carbon dioxide is, some of it's absorbed by the seas and by land and obviously by, by forests, but a lot of it just remains in the atmosphere, unabsorbed. Um, and that's why we've got some of the highest concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere seen for over 400,000 years. And most of those emissions have come just in the last 150, 200 years. And it's, it still sort of stays there. And what the scientists can say is, how much more of this can you burn before you put so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that uh, temperatures become uncontrollable? You can't um, really reverse it. Once it's there, um, you can't take it back out. And this is the other thing that I find through my sort of talk seeing people is there's a sense from some people is it's going to be okay because, of course, you can reverse all of this. But once we know, once we've gone to two degrees and then on to three degrees, it really is not reversible, for probably for tens of thousands of years. Once you've done it, you're stuck with it. And all the decisions that have to be made have, have to be made now. Um, I meet pension fund trustees, I meet investment bankers. We, uh, my colleagues, have represented at Goldman Sachs' energy conference and to Citigroup's energy conferences. We do this. And they say, well, of course, Mike, this is a problem not for today. It's a problem for 50 years' time. We really don't need to worry about it now. But really, these are crucial decisions that people are making. It's certainly within the next 10 to 15. If you think that we want to go to one and a half degrees, um, we really need to be turning the tops off within the next five years. I can't see any scenario where that's going to happen. What this shows you is historical emissions and the carbon budget, really, on the, on the right is 2,860 gigatons of CO2 sitting in the reserves of the world's coal, oil, and gas companies. Um, the blue and the gray lines, which you can't really see too much, is what has been burned historically. And the red um, is what's left. What the scientists tell us is you can probably get away with burning. You probably oughtn't to, but you can possibly get away with it. Um, we have an 80% chance of avoiding two degrees. We can't emit more than... 975 gigatons, and there we have the problem. That the red, the red bar is what, is what the companies want us to develop next. So we, we went away and uh, we tied um, these uh, reserves of coal, oil, and gas to individual companies and then to markets. And there's only sort of two bubbles that I really want you to look at. One on the left is the United States. The size represents the future emissions from reserves of these different fuel types. Um, and it's relative to the size of the market. Obviously, the New York Stock Exchange, the New York market is vast. But the other one I want you to look at is, is the one in the middle, the UK. London is, is, is a global, is probably the global financial center for the mining and the coal and the oil industry. If you're concerned about climate change and you think that the financial way is to approach it, you probably only really want to deal with two markets, the, the US market and the UK market. If you're sitting here and you've got fund managers in London that look after your assets for you, you want to be thinking hard about this. If you're invested in the London market, you want to be thinking hard about this issue. Um, that's why the Bank of England's got so interested, because actually what this is, is a transfer of risk onto individual pension funds, individuals who are taking on these future risks. So um, let's just sort of go back to the idea, the concept again. Um, we've worked out, well, governments own most of the unburnt reserves, you know, Venezuela and the Saudis and the Russians. Um, so we've allocated a share of a carbon budget to the publicly traded companies, you know, the ones like Exxon and Shell. And we've given them 225 gigatons of this remaining 975 budget. Um, just the proven reserves, which is what the companies say they have a 90% probability of extracting, is 762. That's without giving governments a share. This is what the, they've said to the market that they have. You know, people like Rosneft and Shell and BP. And the 1,541 is what they're saying that they're using your money to develop next, which is what their, which, which you would call their resources. Why do we call it a carbon bubble? I want to be clear, we didn't call it a financial bubble. It may be, but we didn't call it that. It's a carbon bubble because the 1,541, the red, doesn't fit into the green. And that's why we have a problem. That's why we have to leave so much in the ground. And that's why the business plans of the oil majors are really going to be challenging. 
So let's go back to the time question. Um, you know, if you, if I, I did a, I did a sort of debate with uh, Van, Ben Van Buren, who's the, the chief executive of Shell, uh, but not in the same room because he, he wouldn't be interviewed with me in the same room. So he interviewed in one room and then the film cut to interview me in the other room. And his, his narrative, well, uh, we plan to expand, we plan to do more. We see no other scenario other than growth in demand for, for fossil fuels. And I was coming back with a sort of the counter narrative saying, well, if we do, we're gonna have a problem. And a lot of people, particularly the executives of these companies, want to push the challenge out. Not, not, it's not my problem. Actually, it's the next chairman's problem or the next chief exec's or it's the next generation's problem. Um, why are these two lines important? What this shows you is different emissions pathways and different trajectories for the release of greenhouse gases. And there's two dates in there. Based on business as usual, if we don't see these curves flatten, we're gonna break through two degrees in 2031. My maths isn't great, but is that 15 years away or so. Uh, we then break through three degrees not long thereafter in 2045. Uh, we've not seen three degrees for hundreds of thousands of years. It's, it's completely incredible to think what the world would look like at three, um, let alone where we go on to, which is five or six degrees based on current pathways. So if this is true, now, um, to get slightly technical, I know there's some investment professionals here. When you're running a pension fund, you use actuaries to do actuarial calculations. You do what's called asset liability modeling. You do, somebody will join the Trocari pension scheme maybe at 20, 21, maybe leave at 65. You're probably going to be in a pension fund for 45 or 50 years. What we have really is people making decisions. So we need to invest in these assets because we've got pensions to pay in 50 years' time. What we tend not to think about is what will the world look like in 50 years' time? What are the consequences of the decisions we're making today for, for, for the person who joined at the age of 18 to join the pension scheme? This is why what the, the leadership position you have taken with the Trocari pension scheme, it's so important. It's because it's about, it's really saying that the younger generations are just as important to us as the older generations. Um, and if you're running a pension fund, who is more important? Is it the person you're paying a pension to next week? Are they more important than the person who's just joined? I don't think you can treat these people differently. I think they have to be treated the same. And this is why these dates are so important and this issue is so crucial to be addressed today. So um, I, I joked that when I kind of, we did this report, um, we printed 100 copies, not thinking that it was that interesting, to be honest. Um, um, I'm gonna tell you something, I know Sean knows this. I, I, I um, arranged for the launch of the event, forgetting that my wife had bought myself and some tickets to go to a, a, one of these concerts out in Norfolk, and you know, one of these poetry and songs and dance, and I didn't actually go to the launch of the report. I was out in the field watching some some music, and I wasn't didn't think it was that interesting, and um, it wasn't picked up in the papers as such until something happened. Till this American called Bill McKibben uh, from 350.org um, published a, a magazine article in Rolling Stone magazine called "Climate Change: Terrifying New Math." And if you've not read this article, do download it. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of uh, writing of poetry who, who told the story of Carbon Tracker and our analysis in a f much better way than I ever will. And hopefully we might um, hear from Bill a bit later. But he launched this divestment movement that went around the world uh, like wildfire. And he got the report because one of those 100 copies ended up in the hands of Naomi Klein. And then Naomi Klein then gave it to Bill McKibben who then you know, wrote, wrote the article, and that's why I'm still doing this kind of work five years on when I thought you know, I'd, be, I'd go back to the rest of my life, um, whatever that was. So it was, I think it was John Lennon that said, life is what happens when you're planning to do other things. And I'm still you know, enjoying what we're doing with Carbon Tracker because we're seeing real action. And, and what the divestment movement has done, it started off tiny. It started off with a few institutions like Ashton and a few others committing themselves to divest from the fossil fuel industry. And our lead funder at the time, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, uh, then decided to join the divestment movement. And since then, it's really grown. And I was in Paris to see the announcement that $3.4 trillion of pension schemes, of foundations, of individuals uh, have committed themselves to divest from the fossil fuel sector. Um, and that little idea of the carbon bubble, this idea that we used in the first report, I was in New York to see um, the carbon bubble being kicked down Wall Street and metaphorically burst on, on the horns of the Merrill Lynch bull um, by, by climate campaigners. And you can watch this, this sort of short video on YouTube. And then stories picked up. BlackRock's 
FTSE deal shuns fossil fuel companies and carbon bubble, which talks a little bit about carbon tracker, drives the debate and how we saw um, citizens begin to move. And I've not, so I've, I've found in my basement um, from 1983, the photograph of me outside Kingston Council Town Hall in Surrey with my divest from apartheid. There's me standing there with a banner. Don't invest in the profits of apartheid. And uh, looking back at that sort of young man as I then was, um, what was that, 30 odd years ago, um, today I see very similar young men and women driven by the same desire for change, driven by the same desire to take on um, the bases of power, uh, taking on the financial institutions which are taking us in the wrong direction. And I'm, I applaud the uh, enthusiasm. And sometimes what happens is that the students and the young people um, stand up and they race against the metaphorical machine guns of Wall Street and they got knocked down and then another group of students stand up and they march in the same direction because they, they know that these decisions are so crucial and it's so important to take them on. But it's not just um, the uh, moral arguments which are very clear and profound to divest but also the financial. I want to turn to that now. Uh, that um, the first people to pick up our report after Bill McKibben was the Norwegian government pension fund, which is one of the largest in the world. I'm in Oslo on Friday, joining an event with the Norwegian prime minister on this issue. Um, and they looked into the analysis and the research to investigate these questions. And the Swede, this, the AP2 funds is a Swedish government pension scheme that has begun to, the process of excluding uh, fossil fuel companies from its portfolio. Um, and I was... Um, in Paris to see the announcement of AXA, which is a large insurance company, that, um, that, that who, the chief exec said he'd read our first report. Um, he must have downloaded it from the web because there were only printed copies left. But he said, and we read it, and we've divested 500 million from coal assets. And so people are thinking hard. And divestment can happen in a number of ways. Um, one of the ways that it's actually happened is divestment through what through value destruction, what Michael Liebreich has said, well, look, if you didn't divest, actually what's happened is these companies have gone bankrupt. You've divested because you've lost all your money. And in the case of companies like Arch Coal in America and Peabody Coal, which have gone, Peabody's not gone bust yet, but a number of its others like Consul Energy um, have gone into receivership because of, of um, the challenges and the financial challenges. And Peabody said in its filings to the Securities Exchange Commission that the divestment movement had affected its ability to raise capital. So what does this show you? The dark line heading towards the bottom is the index of the global coal companies. They've just lost investors' money. Uh, the New York State pension scheme lost $150 million a year last year alone from its fossil fuel investments. The brown index shows you the decline of the oil and gas industry against the green, which is the, the new energy index of showing the performance of clean energy companies. Um, and so fossil fuel free funds have outperformed conventional portfolios over the last five years. A question we really have is, is this cyclical? Is it possible that this is just a short hiatus? China is not using zinc and copper is, is not in the same way it's not using iron and steel and coal. Maybe this is just a temporary phase. And I want to turn to that now because I believe that actually what we're seeing is a fundamental structural change in the energy markets which make uh, this a, a far more fundamental change. And uh, we produced a paper um, called Lost in Transition, how the energy sector is missing potential demand destruction. What we're actually seeing is how small changes in demand for fossil fuels, particularly oil, are, seeing, are leading to large drops in um, the prices of the commodities such as oil. We've seen a big drop in the price of coal. Um, so let's turn to what happened in Paris and what the signal Paris has given to markets. I think the direction of travel is clear. We are moving towards a low carbon future. Um, we had the Paris Agreement set this two degrees warming target, and we've got a goal of net emissions uh, by 2050. And around 95% of global emissions are covered under this deal. And the INDCs commit the world to much lower fossil fuel demand uh, compared to what's called the business as usual approach. So let's actually look at what the oil and gas and coal companies are saying. And um, what they're saying, and here's, here's a number of different scenarios. Um, this is taken from the IEA, the International Energy Agency. And um, what you'll see there, so on the left is 2000, you've got 2040. 
And what you'll see is creeping demand rising for, for oil. The troubling one is the brown line, which is the predicted rising demand for coal. And then you'll see from a very low base, gas just sort of really driving through. The, the, the line on the right is what's called the 450 scenario used by the IEA to say how much less coal, oil, and gas we would need to use to achieve 450 parts per million, which, some, some, which relates to this two degrees target. So coal consumption um, in the next 15 years needs to be a third less than what's called the new policy scenario. For oil and gas, it's about 25% less. Um, and by 2040, these decline figures increase to 80%, 50%, and 40%. So huge structural changes in the whole energy sector. Um, so how are companies responding? And I want you to think and pause a little bit for the moment. Uh, those who take the approach, and it's a, you know, it's a credible approach, that we need to engage with the boards of oil and gas companies and coal companies, how do we go about engaging with the boards of these companies when they are planning to not to reduce their business operations, but actually to increase and grow. What BP is forecasting is that they anticipate delivering 24% more um, oil and gas to the market by 2035. Um, Shell's current outlook, we had the BP outlook uh, published last week, is huge increases in use of fossil fuels. And OPEC uh, is predicting a 54% increase in use um, of fossil fuels by 2040. Um, now, here's the question. How is it possible for us to reduce emissions to net zero by 2050? How is it possible to reduce emissions um, from oil and gas and from coal? How is it possible when the boards which, of companies, in which we're shareholders and we're the people who, who uh, vote for these people onto the boards, they represent us, you know, nobody else, well, apart from their own interests. Um, how is it possible to achieve that when you've got the whole of the industry committing itself to a huge period of expansion. Um, in this debate with um, uh, Shell, uh, or discussion or exchange of views, uh, he basically said in summary, to paraphrase, he sees no low demand scenarios. He sees no scenario where people would use less oil and gas. And here we have this big paradox, this contradiction, this clash of wills between the planet's needs, society's need to reduce emissions, and the incumbent, dominant, powerful fossil fuel industry and its uh, interests in, in the financial sector to actually plan for a huge period of expansion. How do we reconcile these contradictions? How do we get there? Um, some of this is beginning to be unpicked, and part of it's to do with the economics of the sector. Um, Goldman Sachs reported that um, based on the current oil price, and I want to turn to this now, a lot of the projects being planned by the oil companies don't make any economic sense. They call it, uh, Goldman's called them zombie investments. And Citigroup, looking specifically at Carbon Tracker's idea of stranded assets, said, well, actually, if this industry, the fossil fuel industry, goes off in the wrong direction, there's $100 trillion of potential stranded assets in the fossil fuel industry. $100 trillion begins to sound like a large number, to, even to me, um, which... Uh, uh, which could be from um, companies really misreading demand for fossil fuels. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, ask you to um, just pause for a minute whilst I'm going to say a few technical things, and then I hopefully this will make sense um, on the screen. Um, what we did at Carbon Tracker is to look at all the world's remaining oil and gas projects. And here we're just going to look at oil, and we wanted to understand the economics. So if you're going to use less oil and less gas and less coal, one of the ways to do it is to say, well, if you, if you can only produce oil at $100 a barrel, and the price for oil today, I think, is $30 a barrel, then you're probably not going to produce. Whereas if you're in Saudi Arabia, and you can produce oil for $5 a barrel, and you can still sell it at 30 you're going to produce some kind of economic utility. So that created the idea, a carbon track, of trying to work out winners and losers based on the economics of the sector. So when we analyze these projects, we, um, we use the philanthropic money to buy access to what's called the Wood Mackenzie database and the Rice Dead Energy database, which include all the break-even prices of, of oil and gas projects. And I want to highlight a few things here. On the bottom, on the left here, is break-even prices, which is how much does it cost to get a barrel of oil out, out of the ground. And you, you can price it between $0.60 a barrel, which is going to be countries like Kuwait, all the way up to above $150 a barrel which would be ultra-deep water, oil sands, difficult places to get to, like the Arctic. And we then said, who's got all the cheap projects and who's got all the expensive projects? And, that's, and I want you to take your eyes to the, to the top right bar, 
which is OPEC, which is the oil-producing countries. What you'll see there, because of all that gray, is that they own most of the world's cheap oil and gas. So if you look to the economics, you'd probably say, well, Saudi gets to sell the last barrel of oil. Who owns all the expensive projects? The projects which require oil to be above $80, $90 a barrel. I want you to look in the middle bar. This represents all the publicly traded companies like Shell, Exxon, Chevron, and BP. And what you can see there, and you can download this report from our website, is actually those public companies own all these projects that require oil to be above 60, 70, 80, or 150 dollars a barrel. What I'm making is an economics point, which is you wouldn't, you wouldn't give somebody a pound to invest and, and they gave you back from your pound, you only get 20p back. You wouldn't say that was a good investment. And this is what's happening in this industry now. This is a report from Goldman's, annotated by our friends at Bloomberg. And what you can do is you can slice the break-even prices of every major oil and gas project. And this is what they've done. Um, all the major projects around the world, um, and you've got production along the bottom, and you've got break-even prices along the left. And what you've got is you've got these really heavy deep water projects uh, and complex projects um, like Kashigan up there on the right, which requires oil to be above $150 a barrel. On the left, you've got these cheap projects, which go down to $20 or $30 a barrel. When this was published, um, oil was at $70 a barrel, and they put the red line in at $70. Where is it today? It's at, oil's at $30 a barrel. You're going to have to move that red line all the way over to the left. What this graph is, table, is, is really showing you, and the previous one was showing you, is in today's markets, the oil industry is at a point of crisis. So many projects are going wrong. So many projects are losing money. The boards of these companies are in a quandary. You're sitting there. You've got climate limits. You're trying to calculate your budget. You've got shareholders um, uh, sitting on you saying, pay the dividend. Um, BP and Shell alone pay 20% of all the dividends paid on the London stock market. They only pay their dividends from free cash flow. I don't know if this is commonly known, but the big oil majors are now paying their dividends, not from earnings, they're paying it from borrowings. They're borrowing from the bank to pay these dividends. I think we've heard that one before, haven't we? Um, look where that went. Um, they're betting on an uncertain future, but they have to, because actually, if they're to say, actually, the time is up on this industry, maybe they'll be becoming solar companies. Maybe they'll be switching into becoming renewable energy companies. But instead, we've got companies going ahead and what they're saying is that the oil price is going to come back because demand for oil is going to go through the roof. You see, these, these things like called electric cars and fuel efficiency standards, you know, as if these things haven't happened, as if these things aren't up there. Let's go for a real-life situation. This is actually BP. Um, this is a break-even prices of BPs. This is a range of BPs projects. And as you can see, there's a lot of projects up there that require oil to be above $120 a barrel. What keep oil prices up? Demand. What happens when demand disappears from fuel efficiency and from electric cars and from hybrids? I'm sure you've got electric, some electric cars here in hybrids. Prices come down. So even major companies like PP are having to reflect on what the future will look like. Um, so we've seen um, a lot of these projects get cancelled or delayed or postponed, which is probably the good news for the climate, is that as oil prices are kept down, what it's done is it's kept all of these really dirty projects out I was taken out for breakfast by a lobbyist from the Canadian oil industry who said, well, Alberta is really dependent on those oil sands for jobs. So there's a lot of people dependent on this industry for jobs. These are going to be some tough decisions. But Alberta's got some of the dirtiest oil in the world with the oil sands. And they've probably done the world a favor, these Saudis, by keeping oil prices down because it's kept the, sorry to say this, it's kept the Canadians out. When the, when the, when the Canadian oil gets pumping, there's enough there to take us way beyond three degrees, four degrees. Some very difficult choices that we have to face. Um, but people are putting a lot of capital at risk. And if you picked up the FT just the other week, um, people were looking at some of the problems with some of the banks like Deutsche. There's this thing called reserves-based lending where an oil company can go to a bank and say, lend against the value of my reserves. Now, when, when the price or the value of these reserves crash, who gets left with that particular baby? It's the banks. And there was some speculation that Deutsche was not the only one. Many other American banks, for example, um, we're facing problems with, with lending. There's a very, no, very well-known project called Kashigan. It's cost $50 billion today and counting. It's not produced a single barrel of oil. $50 billion. It's known in the city as cash all gone uh, for the obvious reason um, that it's really stretched 
um, the, the patience of even the most patient bankers. And there's a lot of expensive projects out there, like, like the Petrobras project out there that's going to require a couple of hundred billion um, to get going. So a lot of money at risk here, a lot of money at the table. And here's one of the other challenges and, um, being faced. There's, what this shows you is Exxon, Chevron, and Shell, with Exxon up there on the left and Chevron there on the right. The blue shows you the capex, how much money they're spending to find new oil. Now, what would normally happen, the, 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 the red shows you production. Now, for this to work, normally what happens is the red has to be above, sort of has to be a, kind of up towards the blue, sort of traveling in, hopefully in parallel. Actually, what's been happening is the more these companies have been spending, um, the le production is going down. They're not producing more for the money they're spending. And what I'm sort of really saying here is I think, and this is a question, you can tell I read the Financial Times, it said, is the business, yesterday's FT, is the business model of the oil and gas industry broken? Is it, is it a fundamental change? Um, and to some extent, it probably is, because all that cheap oil that was found 20 years ago, you know, $20 a barrel, was all gone. We've used that. And the companies are having to find these new projects out in difficult parts of the world, which is where they're so expensive. So we, we looked at all these different projects, and we said, okay, to keep to within two degrees of warming, um, what has to go? And um, we, um, we found $2 trillion, it's in our latest report we, we launched in Paris, of unneeded coal oil and gas projects in a two degree scenario. There's a lot of LNG, liquid natural gas, that's not gonna be needed. Um, we're not gonna need any new coal mines anywhere in the world to, to keep to two degrees. And there's a couple of hundred billion of, of um, capital at risk there. Um, and the big one is the 1.4 trillion in the oil and gas industry that is not needed in a two degrees world. And we've just sort of set it out in a map to highlight which, where the projects are, which countries, whether it's Venezuela or China uh, or, or Norway or the UK or, or Australia, which are not going to be needed. And just to help those of you that like to go company by company, um, Shell, and, uh, Shell, which is you know, close to home, and BP, um, are planning to spend 76 billion, that's just Shell, on projects that are clearly not going to be needed if we're to try and keep it two degrees. So what I'm really getting to is the economics. There are moral arguments here, there are ethical arguments here, and I want to keep those in our minds because they are the ones that drive us and motivate us. But if we're purely taking a business approach, a financial approach, let's, let's keep to the financials. Let's look at the deteriorating economics of the sector and ask ourselves, is the time for transition now? Is the time to be tough with boards now? Is the time really to accelerate the decarbonization of the sector? And my closing comments are really going to move on to this to, to sort of help us wind up is, um, well, actually, let's state the obvious. To decarbonize the economy, we've got to contract the fossil fuel sector. One of the things, uh, whether you're a responsible investor engaging with companies or, or telling companies to cancel projects or, or just purely exiting these companies, we've got to contract the sector. We've got to cancel and stop these projects. Why are the banks lending to projects that won't see delivery uh, years ahead um, when we know we need to be aligning? Let's get some policies in place inside the banks that restrict lending um, to this uncontrolled, uncontrollable industry. And we need to plan this orderly transition. Um, I wanna, if I was to leave you with any message today and you forget everything else I've said um, to, 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 to so far, is, is this. We have two choices. We have a uh, an orderly transition where we plan the, the next 15 years carefully, we begin the unwind down, we begin to manage our finances in a more measured way, uh, or we actually leave it to the last minute. We leave it to the last moment when we have more extreme weather events, when we've put so much capital in, into these projects because we, we're not convinced change is happening. And we have this moment when governments have to say stop. We, we're going to have to close off the coal-fired power stations. We're going to have to um, stop it in a way that will create huge dislocation in the economy, what we would call a disorderly transition. We have these two choices. Now's the time really for governments and policymakers um, to choose. And all along the time, leadership is coming from um, faith groups and from foundations and from universities and from endowments and from young people, the next generation, driving the divestment movement. So here's, here's the last couple of slides, really. I want to talk about the energy transition. Um, I was at an event with the OECD just a few months ago where um, even some of their leading economists will say renewables will never be cheaper than fossil fuels. 
of course it will never happen, not in my lifetime. And I've, had, I've just seen that a lot just the last, you know, last year. I'm amazing, really. What this shows you is a report from Alliance Bernstein, which shows you prices for um, conventional fuels, fossil fuels. And the gray one is actually the collapse, the massive collapse in the costs of um, producing solar. It's, it's um, something which has transformed the energy sector. And, and there's many parts of the world today where solar is at grid parity and, and actually cheaper than gas in a number of countries. And we still depend on scenarios which are based on old models. This is um, the IEA's predictions of the take-up of, of, uh, of solar. Along, along the bottom is the yellow. The IEA said that in 2007, this is the amount of solar that will be installed. And they've had different expectations uh, over the last few years. Actually, it's the blue line shows you the installed capacity of solar around the world. We're seeing an energy revolution. The economists can't catch up with the installation of clean energy. And the next one is probably, for me, the most exciting one, is that last year, you know, 2014, was the first time more renewable energy was installed in, in that year than in any other previous year, over and above fossil fuels. So it shows you that, that um, clean energy, whether it's from bioenergy, geothermal, wind, solar, or hydropower, exceeded the installation of conventional fossil fuels. So great hope for the future. But it's not just solar, it's battery storage, um, it's, it's new devices um, like the hybrid cars, um, and the order book for the Tesla um, uh, battery. And I was with um, a young philanthropist in London just last week to say he's ordered his own um, Tesla battery for his home. And people will move to energy storage. The world will look very different. We'll have a solar panel on our roof. We'll maybe have a ground source heat pump. There may be a wind turbine at the village level. Um, we may be using some biomass. And we'll probably have a solar battery in the basement. So is change possible? And this is sort of really this is my concluding comments. Change is possible. Um, and change happens very quickly. On the left shows you Wall Street um, in 1900. And what you can see there is it's just horse and traps. There's no cars. And yet within just 13 years, it's the same street. You can't see a horse. It's been swept away and replaced with cars. And sometimes we think it's not possible to make the transition that we're stuck with coal-fired power stations or we're stuck with petrol cars. Um, and actually... Um, transitions happens very quickly. And in markets, um, you see the transition happen there from the old kind of computer hardware companies to the computer software companies. And, and with um, uh, energy, with, we, you know, we think that um, because the market's dominated by Exxon and Shell, that somehow that's what it'll always be. But you never know. In the future, in the same way that energy shifted very dramatically, rather um, uh, car fleets shifted very dramatically from, the, from horses, we could see the same thing happening there. So just to sort of wrap up, and I'm, I know I've kind of gone on and, and, and sort of laid out my case, and thank you for being so patient with me, but uh, I, I wanted to leave with some hope, which, which is that there is a transition happening, but the transitions can only go with leadership and with direction. And uh, we've had some great direction given to us from political leaders and from faith leaders, and now it's individuals have to um, really um, take their own um, responsibilities too. And there's chance for investors, and there's chance for investors to drive this change. So thank you so much for letting me share my thoughts today. <laughs>